So uh, when we look at the moons of the outer planets, uh, the first thing that we notice is that they are very numerous in comparison with the number of moons that the terrestrial planets have. So uh, the number of currently known moons, and we discover more all the time, um, for Jupiter, it has 79, Saturn has 82, Uranus has 27, and Neptune has 14. And many of these moons are what we call uh, irregular moons, uh, and then only a small number of them are what we call regular moons. The majority of the irregular moons are captured asteroids, uh, and we'll see that the origin of the larger moons, uh, there's you know, different origins for each one. So there's lots of different ways for a planet to acquire a moon, and we'll talk about how each of them is likely for different examples. Okay, here's a uh, just a composite of all the major moons in comparison to Earth's moon. Um, so these four, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are what we call Jupiter's Galilean moons uh, because the, these are the ones that Galileo observed through his telescope that helped to, uh, you know, provide the um, not necessarily direct observational evidence for the idea of, of heliocentrism, but a kind of piece of corresponding evidence that showed that not all objects orbited the sun. So we name these moons in honor of Galileo. Um, okay, and then Saturn's moons. Um, Titan is the largest that we'll discuss in the most detail, but it also has um, a handful of other large moons that are mostly icy and some a little bit rocky. Um, Uranus also has, similar to Saturn, a cadre of small rocky icy moons. And then Neptune has one large moon, Triton, um, two smaller uh, regular moons, and then, you know, 14 total moons. So the rest of those are the irregular moons. Uh, we won't talk about the moons of Pluto or Eris today. We're going to come back to that section a little bit later when we talk about other trans-Neptunian objects. All right, so for reference, most of these moons are similar in size to Earth's moon, and uh, Ganymede is actually a little bit uh, around the size of Mercury. So how do we understand these moons and their different surface features? Uh, we're going to use the same frame, the idea of comparative planetology and all the tools that we built uh, in our study of the terrestrial planets, they apply to these moons as well. So we'll look at their size, mass density, um, their composition, so whether they're rocky or icy, whether they're differentiated or not differentiated, so the composition and interior structure we'll consider together. Um, and then we can look at things like a magnetic field and any surface features to determine whether or not there's uh, geological activity. Uh, we may be able to see direct evidence of this geological activity, but not always. Um, okay, so, and then the orbital rotation uh, periods those are kind of most interesting for the Galilean moons, but um, the main thing to notice here is whether the moons are tidally locked to their planets or not. So are they tidally locked like Earth's moon or not? Okay, so all of this information is in these selected moons of the planets and within chapter 12, and I'll have you do a little mini project later on in class using all these pieces of information. Okay, so just to remind you, this is our frame of comparative planetology. <laughs> 